everybody. Welcome to a beautiful Sunday morning here in Wiley, Texas at the Cross Church. Welcome to Online Church. We're glad that you're with us. If you were not here today, you hit the play button. You said yes. You didn't just say yes to God. Yes to church. You said yes to God, and that's a huge thing. So we're glad that you're with us this morning. Happy Easter. He is risen. He has risen indeed. So no matter where you're at, uh, whether you're here locally or you're somewhere around the country right now, Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for being a part of Easter with us. We are so glad that you're with us. It is going to be a great morning. We are glad that you said yes. You said yes to uh, doing the possible and seeing how God does the impossible in your life. And that's a beautiful thing. We are going to be live in the big room this morning with our Easter service. And let me tell you, I, I would like to just tell you to sit back and relax. And you can. You can do that. You can sit back and relax if you want to. It's going to be a great morning. We have just... What I'd like to say is like, oh my goodness, we've, we've taken out all the stops. Sometimes at Easter, churches do that. They just bring out all the stops and then you come back the next week and you're like, oh, it's so different. Here's the great thing. It's not that different. I mean, what we're doing today on an Easter Sunday, if you come back next week, that's what you're going to get. It's it, what, I love of, what I love about that statement is it's going to be pretty much the same thing. So have we, uh, have we kicked it up a notch for Easter? Sure we have. But if you come back next week, that's what you're going to get as well. We, we really think of you in mind. We try to come up and think of the best ways to present the gospel, the good news to you when it comes to uh, encouraging your faith building you up and empowering you so you can go out there and live that life. So online church, it's going to be a good morning. I'm glad that you're with us. Grab your Bibles. Uh, grab grab a, a spirit of just thankfulness. Uh, no matter what you're going through, no matter what is going on, we want to help you this Easter. Uh, remember why you said yes. And if you're visiting for the first time or if you've come upon this, welcome. We are so glad that you're here. We are so glad that however you got this link, however you came upon us, we get to celebrate the good news with you this Easter. We get to share the gospel with you. So and we're going to be going to the big room. Everything from top to bottom is in the big room this morning. It's going to be a great morning. We are so glad that you're with us. Uh, just get ready. Get ready for a good morning. As you can see, we are filled to the brim this morning, and it has been like that the whole time. We have done five services uh, from Thursday to Sunday. And the best is yet to come, and that is you as well. So we are so glad that you're with us. Stay there. Hope you have your coffee, whatever you need, but it's going to be good, okay? We're going to go to the big room. There may be a little bit of a delay, but Easter service is on its way, and you are too. We're glad you're here. Let's go to the big room right now.
fish fry. See Jesus walking to count, his blood dripping, his body stumbling, and his spirit's burden. But you see, it's only pride. Sunday's come. It's Friday. The world's winning. People are sinning. And evil's grinning. It's Friday. The soldiers nailed my Savior's hands to the cross. They nailed my Savior's feet to the cross. And then they raised him up next to criminals. It's right. But let me tell you something. Sunday's coming. It's right. The disciples are questioning what has happened to their king. And the Pharisees are celebrating that their scheming has been achieved. But they don't know. It's only Friday. Sunday's coming. It's Friday. He's hanging on the cross, feeling forsaken by his father, left alone and dying. Can nobody save him? Oh, it's Friday. But Sunday's come. It's Friday. The earth trembles. The sky grows dark. My king yields his spirit. It's Friday. Hope is lost. Death has won. Sin has come. And Satan just a laugh. It's Friday. Jesus is buried. A soldier stands God. And a rock is rolled into place. But it's Friday. It is only Friday. Sunday is a cup.
morning he's worthy. Yeah. Well, welcome to the Cross Church. We're so excited that you chose to join us this morning. I don't know what brought you here today. I don't know where you are in your faith journey, but I do know that if you made it into this room, that the Lord has a plan for your life. You're not here by accident. And the fact that you just showed up today, I believe that the Lord is gonna honor that and he's ready to move and work in your life. We're gonna keep on celebrating this morning, the risen Savior. Before we do, why don't you reach across the aisle, shake somebody's hand, give a hug, tell somebody happy Easter today, come on, yeah.
here to the left of you, we want to invite you to scoot in and make room. Also, um, if you'd like our front row seat, there's some open seats here in the very front. Feel free to move while I'm uh, doing announcements this morning. My name is Teresa Evitz. I am the executive minister here at the Cross Church. And we are so glad you're here for our fifth and our final Easter service of the weekend. We saved the best for last. We are so glad that you're here. As our ushers collect our offering, we want you to know that as you give today, that you are contributing to a special missions offering. Every gift will support our local and our global efforts to love and to serve and to spread the gospel here in our community and around the world. Every gift of any amount meets physical needs and is eternally significant. We spend about $1.3 million on missions each year and every gift matters. This week, the city of Wiley called the Cross Church to help an individual with a transportation need. And we had the privilege not only to help this person get to where they needed to go, but we shared the gospel with them and they trusted Christ as their savior. Isn't that awesome, church? And that is just one of many examples of what God does through the Cross Church every single week. And it's your generosity that makes that possible. So we hope everyone will be part of this special missions offering this Easter. And thank you for joining us on our mission to spread God's fame by making disciples of all people. If you're visiting with us today, we are so honored that you're spending Easter with us. Welcome. We would love to know about your visit. And so we invite you to find a connect card in one of the seats in front of you. If you fill that out, you can return it to an offering basket. You can take it to a giving box that's located across our campus. Or if you take it to the information desk after the service, we have a gift for you and we would love to welcome you in person. If baptism is your next faith step, we wanna invite you to a special baptism celebration on the weekend of April 13th and 14th. We want to baptize more people than we ever have in any one weekend in the history of the Cross Church that weekend. So if you're ready to publicly declare your faith in Jesus Christ, or perhaps you need to put your baptism on the right side of your salvation. What that means is perhaps you were baptized before you truly understood your decision to follow Christ and trust him as your savior and Lord. We'd love to help you with that. You can let us know by emailing us. You can visit the Connection Center after the service and let us know, or just come on April 13th and 14th. We will have everything that you need. We have shirts and shorts and towels and blow dryers. And we are so looking forward to a special baptism celebration with you on April 13th and 14th. And before then, come back next weekend for Rodeo Weekend. Anyone ready for Rodeo Weekend? Yes, April 7th, Sunday, April 7th. We have groups and worship at 9.30, not 9, 9.30 next week, and groups and worship at 11. And then after the 11 o'clock hour, we will have bull riding and food trucks and a lot of fun as a faith family right here in our front parking lot. So again, we hope to see you back here next weekend for Rodeo Weekend. Again, thank you so much for being here with us on Easter. Hasn't it been an extraordinary time together already? Stay connected to the Cross Church. We hope that everyone picked up a summer calendar as you walked in. Save the dates for the things that we have going on for kids and students. And there's some church-wide save the dates in here as well. Follow us on social media. And if you haven't already, we'd love for you to subscribe to our weekly newsletter. It's called The Latest. And you can subscribe by visiting our website, thecross.com. If you scroll to the bottom, enter your email address and hit subscribe and just stay connected to the Cross Church. With that, let me pray for us and we're gonna continue to worship together. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful and grateful for the gift of grace that saves us because of the resurrection of Jesus. Thank you so much for the forgiveness and the redemption that we can receive when we believe in him. Father, I pray that each one here would experience and know your extravagant love and your power over circumstances and sin and death in a fresh way today. And while we can never repay what you have freely given us, I pray that you will use the gifts we've given to continue your work through the Cross Church. Father, we love you so much. And I pray that in everything that we say and do, we would shine your light into this world and bring honor to your name. To you, God, be glory forever and ever. And in the precious name of our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray, amen. The Cross Church, let's stand, continue worshiping together. Give the Lord a hand. Happy Easter. Felt fun. 
Father, we thank you for the blood that gives us that hope. Lord, we thank you that your promises are true. Your words are good. They never fail. And Lord, whatever it is that we've carried with us into this place today, no matter the struggle, circumstance, or situation, Father, there is always hope because of your finished work on the cross. And we say thank you for that this morning. Through the shadows 
So, Father, for my friends that are coming in here carrying very heavy things, things that they feel like are already dead, Jesus, I just pray in your name that you will breathe a living hope inside of them today to remind them that you bring dead things to life and you're not finished working in their situations and in their relationships, those heavy things that they're carrying, God, that your arms are open wide and ready to receive those things. So Father, for all of my friends out there, God, we just place that burden, that heavy thing, that dead thing in your capable hands today. And we give that over to a living God who breathes new things to life. Father, we thank you and we love you and we trust you. We pray all of this in the powerful, living name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Thank you for worshiping, church. Hey, John! John, where are you? I'm at the tomb! John! <laughs> okay, all right. Um, if you ever find yourself saying um, disaster comes in threes, you're welcome. You got that from me. I am telling you, these past three days have just, have just been so insane, so incredible. Uh, uh, okay, so, um, so we're all in the upper room, right? We're all trying to figure out what to do next. All of us disciples are all in the upper room. And Mary, I hear Mary. She's running up to us, all right? We're all just trying to figure out what to do. We're all very sad. And Mary comes running up, and it sounds like, it sounds like she's saying beehive, beehive, beehive. 
And I'm like allergic to bees. I keep them out, right? It's been a rough few days. I don't need that, right? I don't need to puff up, right? And, but as she got closer, I heard, her, she, I heard her correctly. She was saying, he's alive, he's alive, he's alive. And we're all like, what, what does that mean? What does that mean? She said she was at the tomb. It was empty and an angel was there. And then John, John looks at me and says, hey, Peter, we got to go to the tomb. And I'm like, why? Why do we need to go? Why do we need to go? And John says this to me. He, he says, Peter, don't you get it? This is everything Jesus said he was going to do. And he did it and it's done. <laughs> John is so good at alliteration. He is so good at words. He should write a book. He is so good at the words. I'm telling you, he is so good at the words, right? And so I, have, I hightail it down here. And if, John! And if John says he beat me, he is totally lying, okay? I beat him, FYI, all right? He's the writer. It may look different, but don't let him canonize that, all right? If you see him, you say something, all right? Do it for Johnny, okay? I'm telling you this right now. It has been so crazy. Uh, these past three days, it, it, it's like this. If MSNBC and Fox News had a baby, so many stories, so many things going on, right? But I'll spill some tea for you here. Uh, so Thursday, Thursday night, we all get together. We have a big meal. It was kind of like a last supper. It was, it was amazing. And then we go into the garden. Jesus wants us all to pray. Um, he asked me, James, and John to come a little bit further. And he wants us to pray. We keep falling asleep, FYI. We had a big meal. Bread. It just makes us sleepy, all right? When you cob load like that, it's like tryptophan. Ozempic can't even help you with that. You know what I'm saying? So many things going on. Uh, he goes a little bit further. I remember him saying something about um, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He does something. He says, uh, if you can take this cup from me, not my will, but your will. And then, and then uh, the guards, all the guards, the Roman guards came around him. They wanted to arrest him. Judas kisses Jesus on the cheek. I try to defend Jesus, all right? I mean, it was so cool. I grabbed my sword in slow motion. I'm going for this guy. I end up cutting off a servant's ear. And, and um, Jesus, in the midst of... I'm a fisherman, not a swordsman, all right? And, uh, and, I, and Jesus, in the midst of chaos, just grabs that ear and puts it right back on this guy. I'm like, that is so cool. Do that again. He's like, now's not the time, Peter. Now's not the time. I'm like, cool, 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 right? So they took him away. And um, we all... Uh, we all ran away. And I'm telling you that night, um, we all scattered, except for Judas, we all scattered. And um, it's like this. I know what they were doing behind those gates to him. They were putting him on trial, and they were beating him, and they were, they were, they were just doing so many things to him. And, and all of us could do, we were just trying to mind our P's and Q's, we were just trying to lay low. So many eyes were on me, so many accusations, so many eyes were on me. It would have been better if you were the bachelor handing out roses than me that night, all right? It was just bad, it was just so bad. And then all of a sudden I found myself, it must have been early morning, I'm so tired, I fall asleep, and I fall asleep under this tree, and, and I... And, and I eventually wake up, and, and, I hear, and I hear these people, like they're just yelling things. And when I wake up, I see that they're guards, and, and, I, and, I, know, and I know who that is, and I know what they've been doing to him all night. I mean, he's hardly recognizable. He's just beaten to a pulp, and he's so bloody, and, and, I, and I know what they've been doing to him. And they're just yelling, and they're pushing him back and forth, and they're like, come on, Jesus, where's your heavenly father now, huh? And they're just spitting on him and mocking him and beating him, and I couldn't help it. I just, leave him alone. You don't know what you're doing. Just stop it. Just stop it. And one of the guards um, recognized me from the garden ear incident. And um, he goes, he, him, he's one of the disciples. I'm like, no, I'm not. Just leave him alone. You don't know what you're doing. And um, two, two things happened at that very moment. Uh, I heard the most blood-curdling sound I ever heard. I heard this, um, this rooster clucking. And um, the second was... I'm looking right into the eyes of Jesus, and uh, if you ever met his gaze, I mean, you, you, can't, you can't escape his gaze because he has those eyes, and it wasn't of judgment or, or guilt, or it was just of love. I would love to tell you that I stayed, but um, I mean, why wouldn't I, right? The guy that walked on water with Jesus, he should be the most faithful, he should be the most courageous, right? But I ran, we all ran, we all ran, and so um, I hightailed it down here on a wing and a prayer hoping that Mary was saying that the tomb was empty. And it's, and, and it's empty. He, he's not here. His grave clothes. Why didn't they take his grave clothes? Grave clothes are for dead people, so that means he's not dead. That means he took these off himself. Why did he fold his... He folded his headpiece. Why did he 
Why did he fold his headpiece? Okay, think, Peter. Think, 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 think. What, what, what did the angel of the Lord say? Um, what does this also mean? Uh, the angel uh, said, go tell the disciples and Peter that everything is okay. He is risen. <laughs> it's true. He is risen. Everything is okay. <laughs> go tell the disciples and Peter that... Go, go tell disciples and Peter. He said my name. And my lowest of lows after I've denied him left and right. If there was a mirror, like these past three days, if there was a mirror, I could look in the mirror and just go, you messed up. You messed up. You're worthless. You're stupid. You know better than that. And he said my name. <laughs> said my name <laughs> if he's not in these grave clothes I don't have to live in this baggage either <laughs> I guess there's um, only one thing to say then <laughs> and John's gonna miss it <laughs> he is risen he is risen indeed Amen. How are we doing this morning, Cross Church? Everybody good? Man, what a joy it is to be here. Can you do this? Can give it up for my friend Eddie James? Can you do that? Can you give it up for our amazing worship team? They did a great job. We had a featured young man. His name is Jerome. And we do this. Man, these guys, uh, my friend Jordan Gregory he gives leadership to this, makes all these things happen back there in the back. My friend Scott Finch, he's our creative pastor. You give it up for all these folks. This is our fifth service of the weekend, and uh, we're grateful. In fact, uh, man, as we come into this last week, uh, this last service of this weekend, uh, I want to talk to you about these grave clothes because one of the things that's fascinating when you start reading the story of Jesus in John chapter 20, which is where we're going to go. So if you have a Bible, you may want to go there, is you look at the story of these clothes and the detail in which it talks about how these clothes were folded, the headpiece. See, when a person in the first century was embalmed, what would happen is this. They would uh, take him. It was almost like mummification. They would take these linen strips and they would begin to wrap the body just like we're kind of accustomed to when you've ever seen like in, in Egypt and that kind of thing. And they would take ointments or various nards, whatever that is. They didn't embalm the way we did. But then they would have this, this headpiece. It was a separate piece. It was a shroud. And what is so interesting is that the Bible says that one little detail that he folded up that headpiece. And I started thinking about that. And when you read this account, uh, as we will here in John chapter 20, it says this, now the first day of the week, uh, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been rolled away from the tomb. Now, you got to understand some. That stone would have been about 2,000 pounds. Uh, they would have notched it in the ground, so they would have rolled this 2,000-pound this stone in front of basically what would have amounted to a cave that had been built into the, the side of a mountain. And it goes on, and it says this, and so she ran, and she went to Simon Peter, and the other disciple whom Jesus loved, and that, that beloved disciple was a man by the name of John. He wrote this book, and he said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have laid him. And so Peter ran out with the other disciple, and they were both going toward the tomb. And both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. You know this was written by a couple of competitive dudes, don't you? Because who else would have been like, yeah, I want you just to know, all of y'all, that I beat him and then getting there. I mean, that's just crazy right there. And, he says, and both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He's got to mention it again. Not only did I beat you, but I beat you bad. And then he says <laughs> this, he says in verse 5, And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. So John gets there first, and he would have seen these little pieces of, of linen cloth that had been discarded there in the, in the tomb. And it says this, it says, and, and, and then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb, and he saw the linen clothes lying there and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen clothes, but folded in place by itself. 
So it had, there was time taken after the resurrection for this to be folded and placed accordingly. And then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first, once again, wanting to point out how slow Peter is, he says, um, he said, also went in, and when he saw, he believed. You know, that's my hope and heart this day is this, that for some of you, you may believe for the very first time. You see, I got one point to drive home with you, and it's simply this. His clothes make the difference. Say it with me. His Oh, one more time. We can do better than that. It's a last service here at the Cross Church. All right, let's try it again. His clothes make the difference. Let me ask this question. How many of you bought something or wearing something kind of special for Easter today? Anybody just kind of raise your hand up? I remember when I was growing up, a little kid, um, I didn't really like Easter because my mom would always make me put on itchy clothes. You know what I'm saying? And so, like, she dressed me up like this. Look at that. Everybody say, ooh. Everybody say, ah. Oh, look at that. And, um, and here's the thing. Here is my promise to you. I don't really wear suits much. But if you die or get married, I'll do that for you. Anyway, so... There I am in my, my suit. Didn't really like my suit, but I did like my dog, Benji. I remember that was my dog, Benji, that year. I got my little stuffed animal. And I do remember that Easter egg basket because in that basket, there was this chocolate-covered caramel egg that was about the size of a loaf of bread. And it was amazing. It had my name on it. And I used to slice that bad boy up. I wish I could go back in time and just take that egg back to this moment. Well, here's the thing. Down through the years, by the way, I got some folks sitting up here in these front row seats, and I just want to say thank y'all for doing that. So, look, you get a, a chocolate Easter bunny. Hey, right here. There we go. We're going to go right there. I got these. They've been, they've been backstage since, hey, right over there. Look at that, right there. Okay. And then I'm going to go, hey, right over there. Look at that. I, that was terrible. Anyway, they've been. Hey, I, I'm serious. They've been there since last year. No, I'm, not, I'm, just, no, I'm just kidding. They, they, they've been there at least, no, they've been here this week. Anyway, here's the deal. So over the last few years, I, uh, I've tried to dress up a little bit for, for Easter, kind of, through the years. And this is my 18th year at the Cross Church for Easter. And after you've been doing, I, okay, thank you. That's really unnecessary, but thank you. But anyway, so um, the first thing is this was an outfit a few years ago. And um, you can see that, but come on, yep, there he is. I was like, man, really? I was like, man, somebody let me leave my house looking like an Easter egg. Like nobody, nobody loved me enough to do something about that. And that's sad, you know, but it got worse. I gotta be honest with you, I feel bad for you people. It got worse, because look at this. Oh, whoo, man, I'm like, man, I was like, that's a white jacket, isn't it? You know what that tells me? It tells me I didn't have any friends. That's because some, a friend, some, you need to have a friend tell you, no, 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 no. Ladies, I'm just telling you, men, we need one of those friends. Um, then I decided one year, I was like, okay, I'll be hip and cool pastor. All right, there we go. So notice the fade. And then you're going to see a theme that got, gets interrupted here, okay? Because then look at this. Look at the khaki, okay? Then what happened was COVID. Y'all remember COVID? And went to COVID, and nobody was here that year. Y'all remember that? How many of y'all remember the COVID year? Remember the COVID year? And y'all were just at home watching TV. And how many of you had one of your faces out here on these seats? Anybody had one of your faces? That's what those are, all those little, those little placards of people's faces, right? And notice my face right there. <clears throat> notice how round my head is. Let me tell you what's going on. Now, hey, hey, don't judge me. Let me tell you what's going on right here. This is a man who was in captivity for two months doing nothing but making and eating banana bread. Y'all remember that? Remember that? That's all we did. It's like, you want some banana bread? Well, I guess. We ain't got nothing else to do. Bananas are cheap. It's about the only thing you could get because you couldn't get toilet paper. Remember that? That was fun. Let's go do that again. Anyway, so, uh, I mean, you could have just traced my head. Perfect circle right there. Look at that. That's what banana bread will do to you, people. All right? So, watch it. And then notice the theme. Khaki. Okay, look at this. Khaki. And look at this. Khaki. And here we are today. Khaki. So, um... I'm going to work hard next year to break that trend. But here's the deal. See, clothes make the difference. And his clothes make the difference in the Easter story. See, there's five things I want to give you really quickly. If you're ready, say ready. Ready? Somebody say his clothes make the difference. Ready? His clothes make the difference. And the first one is it proves that he is Savior. You go, where do you get that? Um, well, so a few weeks ago, I was spring break. Took my family down to New Orleans, and uh, we went down, and some of you are like, what is a preacher going down to New Orleans? You want to go to Bourbon Street? <laughs> anyway, I'm like, no, I'm a middle-aged man. So you know what I want to do? I want to go to the World War II Museum. Amen? Okay, that's what I did. 
And then because I'm morbid, I took my family on a cemetery tour. Can I just say that? It's like, hey, kids, it's going to be a great time. It's going to be a lot of fun. So we did. We went to this old cemetery. It's the old, one of the oldest cemeteries in America because New Orleans is one of the oldest cities, cemetery number one. And there in that cemetery, I learned some things. Like, for instance, this is Nicholas Cage's tomb, okay? You remember the American treasure guy? You'll notice a little, little saying there, kind of ties to his movie. He wants to be buried there. Uh, he's not in there yet, but he's already prepared to do that. It can hold six people. So, you know, maybe you can rent a room. Anyway, then um, the second thing was this. Notice the crypts there, though, in the city, Okay. Yeah, because understand, they bury people above the ground. They don't bury them below the ground. Why? Because you get a foot and a half into the ground, the water table hits. Nobody wants to see grandma float down the street. See what I'm saying? And so they put them in these. And here's the deal about these crypts. They're kind of like pizza ovens. All right? You're like, that's gross. Worst pizza ever. Anyway, but now they, they put grandma in one of these, these crypts, and there's no casket. And they brick it back up. And here's what happens. Over the, the next year, uh, Louisiana state law says that you can open up a crypt, a, a crypt every 366 days. Um, because what happens is this. The temperature in there is 135 degrees. And so it's just like a slow cook for a year. And so grandma beca just becomes ash. And there's no bones, there's no flesh, it's just ash. And then let's say grandpa dies on day 366. We just crack that bad boy back up, scoot grandma to the side, put another dude in there. That's why families can use this for hundreds of years, right? Same was true at the time of Jesus. Look at this. If I could take you there today, this is the garden tomb. They put that big old stone in front of that. They would put a body in there. It was hot. It's the Middle East. It's hot. They would just literally slow cook, slow deterioration. They would rot. And everybody, now think about this, every single body that had ever been interred in a tomb just like that, they all over a period of time rotted. But the Bible had predicted, God had said before that he would send a, a, the Savior, he would send the Messiah and in fact, in Genesis chapter 3, we even see that little intertestamental echo that, that he was going to, even right after man sinned, he was going to do something to redeem mankind. And in the book of, of Psalms, it literally says this, because you will not leave me in the grave, you will not let your holy one rot. I want you to understand there's been lots of people who said they were God, who said they were the Savior, who said they were the Messiah. There's one who proved it some 2,000 years ago because his body never rot in a grave because he got up because he is risen today. You see, that's something we should be fired up about. <laughs> you see, his clothes make the difference. Say it with me. His clothes make the difference because here's the thing. Resurrection from the grave validates his words. His, his clothes, those folded clothes, they validate his words. You go, how do you get that? Well, Jesus made some, some crazy claims in his day. He said that he was God. You know what they'll do to you if you claim you're God? They'll say you're crazy. You got to be able to back that up somehow. He said he had the power to forgive sins. He had the ability to, to go up to people where they're a blind man or a crippled man and, and not just feel, physically healing them. He said, your sins are forgiven. People like him said, blasphemous. That'd be true unless you're God. You understand, um, he associated with some of the wrong people. Jesus hung out with, 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 fair, with, with tax collectors and drunkards and people who had bad reputations. And you understand people said, well, he's just a friend of sinners. And by the way, when Jesus hung out with them, he wasn't trying to validate lifestyles. He was trying to show them a better way. And, and, and yet people would say, well, you know, if he was really who he said he was, then he wouldn't do such things. No, Jesus, because he's the Messiah, he came to seek and save people that were far from God. You see, um, the, the only people that Jesus ever got upset with were religious people. Y'all know that, right? Like the people he got mad about <coughs> were the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the people like that. And some people say, well, you know, I've always been a Baptist, or I've always been a Methodist, or I've always been a whatever. I would say this, be careful, because there's going to be a lot of Baptists in hell. You know how I know? Because I know a lot of them. You know what I'm saying? I'm just being honest. It has nothing to do. Jesus came hard down on religious people. 
And, and he had some ethical teachings that were totally controversial back in his day. He believed that people that, ha- that had physical abnormalities, whether they be mental, whether they be physical, that those people had value. That's why Jesus said, when you've done it to the least of these, you've done it unto me. That's why Jesus said, we should take care of widows and orphans. That was totally foreign to their minds back then. But you know how he validates that? He validates that. Because what he did, in fact, you know, we live in a world today that just is inundated with false news. Yes? Y'all know we got an eclipse coming. Did you know this? And I'll just say this. Some people are, they don't like TikTok. I think TikTok's amazing. You know why? All the crazy people are on TikTok, okay? So Facebook and these other, like, they'll, they'll monitor to you. Oh, oh, on TikTok, there's no filter on that bad boy. And so we got all these people that are claiming that the end of the world is coming, you know? Did y'all know this? I mean, like, because, you know, the, 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 so the, this eclipse is going to come across like Nineveh, and it's going to do all these kind of things. It's going to make this X, and then there's going to be this fault line, and then we're going to have the world's going to end, and Jesus is going to come back. And I'm like, man... I don't think most of that is true at all, but I will say this. In the event it is, I'm not paying any of my bills till after the eclipse. Can I just tell you that? <laughs> I'm just like, why let them get that money? You know what I'm saying? We might as well have some fun, right? And so, but, but here's the deal. Whenever you, you make claims like Jesus, you got to back them up. In fact, Jesus said in Matthew 20, he said this. And Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, and he sent the 12 alongside. And on the way, he said to them, listen to this. See, we're going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over the Gentiles, be mocked and flogged and crucified, and he will be raised up on the third day. You see, whenever you make all these claims and you say, all the claims I'm going to make about I can heal, I can forgive sins, I can give you eternal life, you got to back them up somehow. And let me tell you something, because of those empty grave clothes, because Jesus got up out of the tomb, you can trust that he is who he said he is because he did what he did. Amen? You see, that's the thing about it. His clothes make the difference. Say it with me. His clothes make the difference. Notice this means relationship available. You go, what do you mean? He comes up out of the tomb and the first people that he, he, he reveals himself to are women. Now, ladies, I understand that you've all grown up in a Spice Girl world. You know what I mean? So tell me what you want. What you want blah, blah, blah. You know, I mean, you can be anything you want to. Girl power, right? Okay. The first person to ever validate women was Jesus. He trusted women with the fact that I've resurrected. And he was like, I'm going to tell you. And it gives incredible value to ladies. And this is why I think we need to, we need to re-embrace that because we live in a culture today where we're at war with what men and women ought to be. We're trying to make women into men we're trying to make men into women and even let them swim against them. You know why? Because they can't win against men. But anyway, that's the thing, right? And, and here's the thing about it. Jesus validates all those all womanhood. He also shows up with his disciples. And he, and, and, and he appears to them. But there's this one disciple that he shows up to that just, it really gets me. His name was Thomas. In fact, he was known as a doubter. Can I ask you an honest question? How many of you have ever had a doubt about something about faith or God? How many of you ever had a doubt? I'm going to give you, because we're in church and it's Easter and whatnot. And some of y'all are going to break out of here and, you know, go eat some ham because Jesus was Jewish. And I've never understood that. But anyway, you're going to. How many of you have ever had a doubt? You've ever, you've ever had a doubt? Yeah. And here's the thing about it. Jesus is big enough for your doubts because he goes to Thomas and he says, hey, look. Um, you know, Cause some of you are, are here and I'll just be honest with you. you you're, it's like a hostage situation for you today. Like somebody drug you here, you know what I'm saying? And, and by the way, you know the universal sign for get me out of here, just do like one of these and one of us will, we'll contact the authorities and get you out of here, you know what I'm saying? Because some of you, some of you people like you're saying, man, I'm just here for the ham, you know, like, my grandma said I had to come up in here, and if I don't had to listen to you, and you need to drink decaf, and I already got some issues with that. And but here's what you to know: Jesus is big enough for your doubts. I'm not talking about the sky fairy today. I'm telling you, he's real because his clothes validate. And here's he's so personal 
He wants a relationship with you. In fact, one of the things that's fascinating, if you and I had lived in Jerusalem in the time of Jesus, we would have seen this building right here, the temple, and it would have been where all of the quote unquote religious practice took, took place. And see, Jesus didn't come to, to accentuate and to cause more religion. In fact, religion has sent more people to hell than, than lots of things. And, um, but Jesus, when he was on the cross, um, he said, it is finished. What, what did he mean by that? If you look at this diagram, you're gonna notice that there in the middle of that diagram, there's a place called the Holy Place and the Holy of Holies. Now the Holy Place was right outside the Holy of Holies. The Holy of Holies, it was said that that is where the Ark of the Covenant was and that is where the Shekinah glory or the very physical presence of God rested on the earth. And it was limited to that one place. And it was limited that one person, one time a year, the high priest could go in there and he could sprinkle on the altar the blood of a lamb that would be sufficient to forgive the people for one year for their sins. But when Jesus spread his arms out on a hill called Calvary and he said, it is finished, one of the things is what it was finished. Well, what was finished was sin. What was finished was death. What was finished was hell. But let me also tell you what was finished. What was finished was separation because it says in Matthew 27, 51, and behold, the curtain of the temple, there was a curtain between that holy place and the holy of holies. The temple was torn into two from top to bottom and the earth shook and the rocks were split. You see, the, 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 the historian Josephus says this, that curtain was a, a foot thick. It was made of this woven materials. To rip it, it would have taken an oxen team pulling this direction and an oxen team pulling that direction to even bring a minor tear. But I want you to understand something. The resurrection power of Christ, the Shekinah glory of God that was trapped there on that hill, whenever he opened up his arms and he died and he said, it is finished. I want you to understand he did that so that his presence would be manifest to you and you today, church, because he his claims are backed up by the fact he resurrected and now he can live in you. He can live in you. <clears throat> Some of you need to embrace that because you see his clothes make the difference. Say with me, his clothes make the difference. And I want to just tell you this, Jesus has this way, because of those folded clothes, there's triumph and tragedy. You go, what do you mean by that? He can take your bad days and he can turn them into good days. You see, um, some of you are here listening to my voice today. I'm just going to be straight up honest with you. Um, you walked away from church or Jesus a while back. Maybe you knew about him a little bit, but you walked away. Maybe you walked away because there were some people that hurt you in the church. You saw some hypocrites. And, and it's real popular today. I've got church hurt I'm like, now, I don't know about y'all. There's some hypocrites at Walmart, yes. <laughs> There's some hypocrites at Dairy Queen, yes. <laughs> but guess what? You get over Walmart hurt and you go back. <laughs> but with church and with the people of God, it's like, well, we're just going to. Now, for some of you, that's an excuse. Some of you, when you were younger, you saw something demonstrated that whatever it is, maybe you thought, well, I, I have an intellectual assent to all of this. And, and so, yeah, I agree with it, but it doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to live like it. I want you to know something. You got, you got another issue there because maybe it never really took for you. But there's some people that the reason that they've, they've struggled is because they have these really deep hurts and they feel ashamed. And they left the church. And, and what I want you to understand is maybe some of you today are living in a, in, a, in a dead thing. Like maybe you feel like it's your marriage or maybe you feel like it's your life situation or maybe it's something you did or something that was done to you. And Jesus had this friend before he died. He had a friend named Lazarus who died. And when Lazarus died, it says that the Bible says that they, they called Jesus to Lazarus' tomb. And Lazarus had been in that tomb for a few days. You can imagine now then the aroma is getting pretty rank. You know what I'm saying? And they call him to that tomb. And, 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 and Jesus d does something that's unimaginable. And by the way, I want you to know something. When Jesus sees your tragedy, I want you to know he knows and he sees and he cares. Because the shortest verse in the Bible 
is connected to the life of Lazarus in John chapter 11 when it says two words, Jesus wept. So when that thing was done to you or, you know, whenever you've been broken over the thing you did, I want you to know something, Jesus wept. But I also want you to know that because of the empty grave clothes, because the clothes make the difference. Somebody say the clothes make the difference. I want you to know something. He has power because the Bible says in this same story that he's the resurrection and the life. And so Jesus has the ability to call dead things back to life. And it says in verse 43, when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice. And, and he said this, Lazarus, come out. And the man who had died came out of a tomb. It says this, in his hands and his feet were bound with the linens, the same linen strips that were abandoned at Jesus' grave. He comes out and he has them bounded around him still. And it says this, and his face was wrapped with the cloth. The same cloth that Jesus folds up is the same one that still bounds Lazarus. And Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Now think about it. I don't know what this was like. Jesus comes to the grave and he says, uh, Lazarus, come out. And I don't know if just like there was some sort of supernatural, you know, just energy or the Holy Spirit just kind of pulled him out. Or maybe Lazarus is just like, you know, coming out because he's got, he's all bound up, you know. And so he's kind of like, you know, I don't don't know, maybe, right? But here's what I know. When he gets there, he says, I'm binding. Some of you, listen to me, you need to be in a church. Some of you need to get reconnected to a church because I'm going to tell you something. You're bound up into some stuff. And, and it, you're not Jesus. I'm not Jesus. And we need some people to come unbind us. We need some people who are going to come up next to us because there was a time when you were walking to church. There was a time when you were close to God. And, and some people say, well, you know, I can, I, can be, I can love Jesus, but I don't have to be a part of his family. Hey, try that in your marriage, Right? Like, yeah, let's be married, but I'm just never coming home. That's not going to go well. I want you to hear a story about some people who I dearly love and I'm so proud of for being vulnerable to share this story with you across this weekend because there was a time when Jesus looked into their life and said, come out. I work in a pretty uh, stressful industry. And I was diagnosed with ADD, and that led to being uh, given amphetamines. And over the years, that progressed to a point of double taking my prescription and then triple taking, and then to the point of shopping doctors and, and pharmacies, and it just spiraled out of control. I knew something was off. He just wasn't himself. As my addiction progressed, I absolutely started to live a a dual life. I had this life that I presented to my friends and my family, and I had this whole separate side that was absolutely obsessed all the time with making sure that I was able to scratch that itch. What I realized was it was the sin and shame of that that really started to build a lot of bricks between me and my relationship with God as well as me and my relationship with Jenna and and with the girls, too. It really came to a head when I was away. I was out of town on a business trip. Jenna called and said that she had found paraphernalia in my desk at home. I wasn't ready to admit it. I wasn't ready to come clean, and so I had denied that for a couple of weeks. There was a moment where I was just in my closet kind of crying out to God going, Like, where are you? I knew that our marriage was never going to be the same until I stopped focusing on trying to put my marriage back together and started focusing on trying to put my relationship with Jesus back together. I think where God really intervened in the situation is I accidentally overdosed. And that was the moment where I realized that I either had to change and follow God's plan for my life or I was going to kill myself. As weird as it may sound, I felt like the lowest point for me was that first week when I was getting sober. I lost my wife, and I lost my family, and I've now lost this crutch that I've been leaning on for years. So I like to look back and say there's a moment when something is redeemed or, or there was a moment where it really started to turn and, 
And that's just not the reality of how it worked. It was a very, very slow process. And for me, it, it started with just listening to Christian music in the car as I was driving to rehab. And just hearing these songs that I believe were true, um, but I wasn't living it to be true. And I had to teach myself again that, um, that God loved me, that He cared for me, that He wanted a relationship with me, um, and that there was a hope in a future. But I was, I was also praying that God would just be real to me. It's only by His grace that I can function. It's only by His grace that I can be the kind of dad and husband that I want to be. I knew that I had to start following His plan for my life if I wanted to keep that second chance alive. Keep clinging on to hope because there really are better days ahead and the best really is yet to come. And, and I know that because we're living it, like we are, we're living that right now. I think we say a lot around Cross Church that it's a place for second chances. And I put that to the test. It's a place where you can be authentic and you can be yourself and people will allow you to, to trip and they'll help you get up. I look back and I know that my hope wasn't misplaced during the dark times. And hope is contagious. And what I love is that now I have this expectation that there's even more on the other side of this season. But what's good is knowing that the hope continues and that there's hope in the small things just as much as there's hope in the big things. Can you give the Lord a hand for that? So appreciate that. Appreciate the vulnerability of that. That's my brother-in-law and my sister. And uh, here's what I can tell you. What I love what my brother-in-law said was this. He said that the, the Cross Church is a place for second chances. I don't know what the dead part of your life is that needs to come back to life. I don't know what the tragedy is that needs to become a triumph. Here's what I want you to know. Because, of clo because his clothes make the difference, right? There's that possibility for you today. You know, maybe when we finish here in just a moment, you need to go straight back to that connection center where we have in that back back there, and the door will be open, the light will be turned on, you'll see it. You can say, hey, we need to connect to the Cross Church. We're grateful that you're here today. Maybe we need to become a regular part of what you and your family do. But you see, here's the last thing I'm going to give you today, and it's simply this. <laughs> see, his clothes make the difference because the best is yet to come. Anybody believe that today? Anybody believe that today? See, when Jesus, when Jesus folded up that headpiece, I mean, why would he have done that? Because he was telling us the best is yet to come. So sometimes when, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling like, you know, like a dad who should do something different than what I normally do. You know, like, you know, I don't I, I spoil the kids sometimes. You know, sometimes we take them to the Golden Corral, you know, and um, <laughs> which is a step up from the Sizzler because, you know, they got a cheese fountain there. You know, it's a, lot, it's, it's a lot more classy, you know what I'm saying? But sometimes when there's like a special occasion at the house, you know, or it's an anniversary or it's a birthday or something, we, it's a graduation. Sometimes we take the kids to a nicer restaurant. Maybe we'll go to a, a place like a Three Forks here in Dallas, or maybe we'll go to Texas. We'll go to some place that's just a little bit, a little bit bougie. And when you go, here's what they'll do at these little bougie restaurants. Now, I, I've got something for you. Everybody gets a little parting gift today, okay? And so for some of you, how many of you are going to have lunch here in a minute? You're going to want this, okay, because we're going to provide you a napkin. In fact, on the end of all of these rows, there's a stack of napkins. I need you to pass those out. Can you do that? Just pass them across your row uh, to everybody. And if you don't have one, you can. Um, one of our ushers can give you one. And when you get them, I want you to wave it at me like this because I want to make sure you're playing along because we have nobody coming in here. And if the sooner you start playing, the sooner we'll be done because I'm just telling you, otherwise I got nothing to do this afternoon. So some of y'all better start waving or y'all better get your second win. I'm just telling you, what's up? All right, you look so good doing that. Anyway, all right, so check this out. I was at one of these bougie restaurants one time. And um, when I, I, I got up, been a nice dinner, had a little appetizer, had a little steak, had a little potato. It was nice. When I came back from my seat, I had to, you know, go to the restroom, kind of want to stretch my legs. The place had some cool stuff on the walls. I wanted to see it. Came back, and they had folded my napkin and put it right there on my, on my table. You know why they did that? 
because they knew I wasn't done. They knew the best was yet to come. Because you know what was coming at the Boozy Restaurant? Dessert. <laughs> That's right. So I was about to just, I, I was just about to like, I, you know, and, and, and I love it when they come and they bring that little tray at these places. Like sometimes, you know, going to get a little bit of that cho- that seven layer chocolate cake. Oh, yes. <laughs> Glory, right? <laughs> and maybe at your house today, you know, maybe you're, you're going to get you a little, I don't know, maybe it's like a little uh, lemon pie or maybe you're going to get you some, you know, some brownies or maybe somebody's going to make some Nana pudding, you know what I'm saying? Right? Anybody going to have a little dessert today? You know, at my house, we're growing up, we, we had the ham because, you know, we're celebrating Jesus. He's a Jew, so let's do that. I mean, it's so weird. Anyway, my mom would make, like, dead man potatoes. It was this one potato casserole that she only made on, on like, on holidays and when you died. That's the only one she gave, right? But my grandma would make that congealed salad. You know what I'm talking about? That one that you're going, nobody eats this but you, but okay, we have it. But then we'd have dessert. And what I want you to do today, whenever you go home to wherever it is, your restaurant or your house, I want you to pull this out when you get your dessert. And I want you to take a big old bite just with your little napkin right here. And all your friends will be like, what is that about? Say, man, the best is yet to come. Now, some of y'all are healthy, and I've been trying to. And so, by the way, don't be, doing, don't be eating sugar all the time. It'll kill you, Okay. But, but if you're really healthy, you're like, well, I'm not going to do that. That's cool. You get your kale, and you just be like. <laughs> and then one day you can be going, well, praise the Lord. I won't be eating kale anymore. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Whatever you, you do, you, okay? Boy, here's what you got to know. When Jesus got out of that tomb, and he folded up that napkin, He said, the best is yet to come. He said, one of these days, I'm going to come back. Anybody excited that Jesus would come back? You see, the the first time, the first time he came as a suffering servant, the next time he comes as a conquering king, and Jesus came, think about it, he came from heaven to earth so he could take you from earth to heaven. Now, this is why you need to dial in. See, if you want to go to Arby's today, you don't need a reservation. They'll take you. You want to run over here through Jack in the Box? Probably not going to have to wait too long. But there are certain restaurants in Dallas today that if you were going to go there, you better have a reservation. Like Maggiano's, ooh, a little Italian on Easter, you better have a reservation. Because we've been here so long, the Methodists are already there. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Them, them players get out early. It's like Christian light. Anyway, so. <laughs> I'm really offended about that. I'm a Methodist. Well, <laughs> just look into it anyway. But uh, But if you're going to go someplace good, you got to make a reservation. And if you're going to go to heaven, you got to make a reservation. You see, Jesus made this exclusive claim. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. Exclusive claim. Nobody goes to heaven except with, through a relationship with Jesus. Some people say, well, I think when we die, we all just... I've heard this. Well, um, We're all just like angels. No, angels are angels. You're never going to die, be a little fat cherub on a cloud with a harp. Never going to happen. You're not going to die and be absorbed in the cosmic energy of the world. No, when you die, you're either going to go to heaven or a place called hell. It's real simple. It's all based on a reservation. Jesus literally defeated hell, death, sin on the cross. So you could have a reservation. Do you have yours? Do you have yours? And it can't be, well, you know, my my parents, I mean, they they go to church, my grandma. No, 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 it's very specific to the person. That doesn't count. 
Well, I mean, I, I've, I've joined a church. No. Jesus came that you would know him personally. His clothes make the difference. He proved it. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, some of you need to make a reservation today because some of you have never trusted Christ your Savior. You don't know if you're to go to heaven right now. And if you say, well, I think I would, and that's a no. Well, I hope I would. Nope. Jesus said this, these things have been written so that you know that you're saved. With your head bowed, you could pray this prayer with me and you could secure your reservation. Nothing magical about this prayer. It means you mean business with God. You say this, dear Jesus, I ask that you will forgive me of my sins in the best way I know how. I invite you to come to my life, be my Lord and Savior. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for the reservation. If you prayed that prayer with me for the very first time, I'm gonna ask that you do something with no one looking around but me. Raise your hand. You prayed that prayer with me for the very first time. Would you raise your hand? Would you raise your hand? Across this room, raise your hand. Awesome. Now listen, there's several hands up. And I wanna be sensitive to uh, time and people and your schedules and all those things. And likewise, this is the most significant eternal business you'll ever partake in. So here's what I'm gonna ask that you do for me today, okay? And you can have somebody do this with you. If your hand's up, would you do this? Would you be able to just stand up? And if you need somebody to stand with you, they can stand with you, okay? Because here's what I wanna do. I'm gonna get you connected to somebody very quickly. So just stand up. We got people standing up across the room. Just stand up. Just stand up. If your hand was up, just stand up. Who else? Just stand up. Just stand up across the room. Okay, who else? Who else? Who else? Okay. If your hand was up, I'm gonna have somebody go to you, okay? Just just stand up there. Awesome. Who else? Who else? Just stand up. Okay. We're going to send some folks to you. Okay. Because I want to really respect our time. We're going to send some folks to you. So just know that. So guys, if some of y'all would start moving towards some of these that are standing, that'd be great. Who else? Who else? Most important thing you'll do today, right here. Just stand up right where you are. Okay. We're not, I'm not going to have you walk down an aisle. I'm not going to make you drink the Kool-Aid. I'm not going to do anything like that. We just want to help you. If mom or dad needs to go, if you need to take somebody with you, a spouse, or where you go, okay? Most important thing you'll do right here. Okay, you may be here today. Can I ask you this? You, you, may, you maybe need to get baptized. You've trusted Christ at some other time. You need to get baptized. I'm going to encourage you when we finish here in just a moment, go straight to our connection center. We'd love to get you connected. You've been looking for a church home? I'm going to send you there as well, okay? Here's what I want to do real quick moving some folks across the room. When we stand, if you did not stand up, but you raise your hand, you could go ahead and make your way to the Connection Center, okay? I'm going to ask all of us stand right now, okay? Don't leave. I'm going to have Jenna sing just a brief song over you as we depart. And here's the deal. Maybe you're here today. You need someone to pray for you. Maybe you're dealing with something really hard. Maybe this is the first Easter without somebody. Uh, maybe this is the first one of loss. Maybe you're just working through some things. You, you can feel free. We're going to have some pastor ministers. We'll have men and women. They would love to pray for you. Please just hang for a second. If you need to go to that Connection Center, join the church, trust Christ, follow our baptism, feel free to do that. But otherwise, I just want you to kind of close your eyes for a moment, hear these words. And if you need someone to pray with you, we'd love to do that. You come. If my heart could tell a story If my life would sing a song If I have a testimony
Well, you're, you're here all the time. You're here some of the time. We're glad you're here this time. We hope you'll come back and see us. I want to speak a blessing over you as we depart today. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Lord Jesus, as we leave today, may we leave full of your resurrection power. In Christ's name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you, church. We hope you enjoyed service. If you have any questions about the message or want to know more about what it means to follow Christ, email us at info at the Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.